Uh, good afternoon, everyone, who's in afternoon time, if you're still in the morning or you've already cruised into the evening. We're glad to have you here. I'm Joyce Ogburn. I'm going to start us off today and talking about what we're going to say. We're going to give a real high-level overview today of what's been happening with scholarly communication and information literacy and those intersections. The ACRL initiative on the intersection started about six or seven years ago, and when it became more obvious that we're all trying to teach people some similar things, and there's so much more complication around the scholarly communication environment, that we need to get a better way to spread the word and integrate it into our information literacy. And then the ACRL framework came out on information literacy, and that gave a new impetus to starting to integrate these two things. And there's a lot showing up in workshops and webinars and even in the literature now about how people are starting to map over between those two. And we've been hearing that more people want to know more about this. And so Paul and I decided to do some sessions for our information literacy librarians, which grew into this webinar. So, so you don't have disembodied um, voices from faces. This is what we look like. Here we are smiling at you today. Um, and I do digital strategies and partnerships here at Appalachian State University, so I work a lot on uh, what we're doing with researchers, digital scholarship, scholarly communication, and things of that nature. And Paul, why don't you tell them what you do? Yeah, so I'm the lead librarian for acquisitions, and so we're, our primary responsibility is acquiring uh, monograph and continuing resources, particularly electronic resources. And the last name is Orkoshevsky, but it, it doesn't really matter. Paul's good. Yeah. So Paul also does a lot of work with intellectual property and copyright. So we've had a great time being partnerships on this expedition together. So here's the, a link to the ACRL Intersections white paper that came out in 2013. So that's what kind of was a kickstart to some of this happening in our profession. And you'll have all these later so you'll be able to get all of these resources together. And part of what it says was that we need to provide strategies that librarians from different backgrounds and responsibilities can use to construct and initiate collaborations with their own campus environments between information literacy and scholarly communication. These strategies or core responses will support libraries in becoming more resilient in the face of the changing digital information environment. So it was not only for helping other people, it's help our libraries to understand more what's happening in this dynamic environment and, um, and how we can grow and be more resilient. So I did something um, about this, uh, about lifelong learning requires lifelong access. So this grew out of me being president of ACRL and reflecting on our new plan for excellence. So I was linking together, you know, you, if you, you can't be a lifelong learner if you don't have access to all these resources. So that was another prompt for what we wanted to do. Other reasons you should be engaged in the intersections is now we have so many opportunities and venues to apply intersection concepts to enhance outreach and increase the knowledge of all these interrelated issues, critical thinking, scholarly processes, and the production of knowledge. And I know many of you are probably doing something similar to what we're doing in creating liaison programs and starting to get people more engaged in outreach. And Paul's going to start us off. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is, is kind of back up to step zero and start with some very basic definitions of, of what we're talking about. And I'll try and weave in some facts and historical developments, but I'm also working toward a particular historical slant on these issues. So keep in mind that this may be a based on a true story uh, as much as perfectly fit with uh, reality. So uh, scholarly communication, the most important thing that I want you to take away from here is that scholarly communication is in crisis. The scholarly communication system developed over the past 400 years, of which libraries are an integral part, is in a state of crisis. And the really bad news about this is that it's been in crisis for 51 years. So just as a little lark, I went into the library literature and sort of just did scholarly communication crisis. And you know, there's been a continuing theme or meme, I guess, in, in the internet age of scholarly communication crisis. Here's some articles. Um, and I, when I first did this a few months ago, I hadn't found uh, much beyond crisis past 2011. So I thought maybe the crisis was ebbing a little bit, but I did another one this morning and found uh, more recent stuff. Although the latest one I found was finding the silver lining in the serials budget crisis. So maybe the crisis is still ebbing. Um, but anyway, snarkiness aside, 
Um, what are we really talking about? So I'm, I'm not going to read all my slides, but I'll read a couple of them. So this one, scholarly communication is the system through which research and other scholarly writings are created, evaluated for quality, disseminated to the scholarly community, and preserved for future use. The system includes both formal means of communication, such as publication in peer-reviewed journals and in informal channels, such as electronic listservs. Um, so how do we get through this scholarly communication? What are the means of doing this? Well, there's two primary means of, of communicating um, in anything, but in scholarly communications in particular. One is in real time, or synchronous, or face-to-face. -face. So that can either be face-to-face, -face or in today, in screen-to-screen. -screen. It could be in the form of a lecture from um, teacher to student. It could also be in symposiums and conferences or webinars. It could also just be at the local watering hole. Uh, another way that this communication takes place is asynchronously, and so in some way of recording it um, and passing it on from one person to another over, over time. And in general, that's been done for most of the past couple thousand years through writing. Now, there was some debate about the utility of this newfangled, quote, writing thing, and how it was a real blow to the proper functioning of academic discourse. And you can read for yourself and hear the disdain in Plato's evaluation of this writing modality. Uh, but in spite of him, it was the way to go for a couple of thousand years. And now whether that um, uh, modality was, or that form of communication was through clay tablets, or starting here, handwritten scrolls, manuscripts that were written down format, movable type makes things both easier to produce and easier e and more distributable. Um, but technology aside, the, the basic unit of the scholarly communication up through about four or five hundred years ago was the monograph. So Newton sort of invents calculus and writes a book about it and then Leibniz says, wait a minute man, calculus is mine and he writes a monograph and then hilarity ensues. Um, the scene changes dramatically, though, in the year 1667, uh, with the publication of the Philosophical Transaction, giving some account of the present undertaking studies and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. And this uh, later on acquired the uniform title, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. And this is the very first scholarly journal. And I was thinking about this, so if you're, you know, if you're the serials librarian in 1667, you check in one journal and you're done for the year, so it's a pretty sweet gig. Um, but from this beginning, and while monographs still continue to be important and are still produced, there is at least a shift in focus toward the journal, and more particularly the journal article. So as scholarly uh, societies formed, in this case the Royal Society, but then other things came down the pike in Europe and in North America, Generally, when they form the society, they get together and they think one of the first things they decide to do is they need a journal so that they can talk to each other, they can put the results of their research and, and share information in the, in the scholarly endeavors that they're, they're looking towards. Um, and if you, look in, if you actually look inside this, uh, this first journal, it's, it's, it's really quite fascinating reading. Um, some of it's quite funny, some of it's still relevant today, but overall, it's more or less science-y. Um, but we know just from looking at the department lists in a, in a course catalog that the seven liberal arts from the medieval ages has, has branched into many, many uh, specializations. And new journals generally have arisen with each of those bifurcations uh, into, into smaller units or into smaller or more focused areas of scholarly inquiry. So we see the atomization of the realm of inquiry over time. In 1869, the journal Nature uh, was dedicated to what was nature, natural sciences. And they would include what we would now call biology, geology, physics, chemistry, and everything else sort of on the stem end of the spectrum. But, you know, 150 some years later, it takes 146 individual nature titles to cover that, that original purview. So journals themselves go through a process of mitosis, um, but then we've also got the, the growth of academic societies, the growth of journals, subdivision of journals, and we get an exponential growth in the number of journals and in the number of uh, articles that are put into those journals. Here's an interesting chart. Um, 
It's the number of journal articles just in science publications per year since around 1907 or so. And note that this is in a logarithmic scale. So those initial dots over here to the left, this is about three, basically this means about a thousand science journal articles to about 10,000 science journal articles. So a one with four, four zeros after it. By the time we get over here to the late, to the mid 20 teens, we are talking about per year, one million plus others less than one million, multiple millions of journal articles published per year in just the, um, in the journals that are covered by the fancy abstractors like Ken Abstracts or Maths.net. So we're not talking about lesser journals, we're talking about pure, mostly peer-reviewed scientific journals. We're talking multiple millions of journal articles published per year. Uh, these uh, millions of journal articles are written by an increasing number of scholars. Uh, this graph is from 1900 through 1999, and it's the total number of newly minted PhDs in the United States over those 99 years. And I'm not sure exactly what this number is, but it's probably like 100, 150 new PhDs per year in the United States. And we see starting basically post-war, a huge increase in the number of doctorates awarded, and this is just in the United States alone. So over 40,000 new, in 1999, 40,000 new PhDs were minted in the United States. So we're not talking about Canada, we're not talking about uh, Europe or the developed world, and we're not talking about China, Brazil, India, and so forth. So I'm sure this number is quite a bit larger than that. So we've seen, uh, growth in the number of uh, scholarly interests, growth in the number of journals, growth in the number of articles, and growth in the number of scholars who are doing all this work. Um, at the same time as all of these things have grown, there's been a contraction and a concentration of who controls the business end of this work. Um, so back in the day, a society would form around some avenue of inquiry and they tend towards starting a journal, which they pretty much did in-house. The editors and writers were generally members of the society. Uh, they might outsource the actual printing, but the editing, review, subscription management was basically all done by the society. And the problem with that is, if you've ever been involved with something like that, is it's a pain in the butt to do all that stuff. Um, and the editors and subscription managers and so forth had to take time away from their passion, which was the scholarship, to do this businessy stuff. So it made sense to retain the content and editorial control of a journal, but outsource the businessy stuff. It also meant that the um, commercial publishers that took on this work could provide an income stream to the society that they otherwise wouldn't be able to maximize. But we know where this has led, led us. And so five publishers, essentially, and this may be a little bit of a loaded term, but five publishers in essence control more than 50% of our scholarly discourse. Um, and this has generally been a, a gradual process, but it did definitely pick up steam in the past 20 years. So in this graph, these are, um, the red and the blue is the movement of individual journal titles from a small to a big publisher. And then the gold pit is, from the, is the opposite way. So we've seen you know, and I think our collective experience validates this, this, uh, these, this data, that we've seen a move towards, you know, these top five, but others, this concentration of the, of, the, of the business of scholarly communication into a small subgroup of, of uh, publishers. Um, not coincidentally, perhaps, um, this has, we've also seen um, significant costs in, uh, in, in scholarly communication. So this is, uh, this, uh, so sorry, ASU it, uh, here means Appalachian State, it's not Arizona State. Um, but our average year-on-year -year price increase is a little under 7%. And this isn't a, a unit cost, this is pretty much, you know, line items on invoices. So on average, Web of Science or, you know, individual journal packages or even individual journals generally uh, go up about 7% a year, which means that our costs of those subscriptions would double every 10.6 years. And of course, 
Um, I don't know about your place, but we generally don't see a doubling of our collections budget in 10.6 years. Uh, what I find also interesting about this 6.78 figure is that for the past 10 years, we've been very minimally exposed to inflation in the United States anyway, where we've averaged under 2% in inflation over the past 10 years. Um, there's a couple of things going on in this chart. One is the sort of the, the, the main narrative that we, we tend to, to send to our, our library clients, and that is sort of the average serial list price. So using a 1990 as the, um, as the 100 base point, on average, the, the serial list price has gone up six and a half times. Um, and that's, that tends to be the story when we talk about, um, you know, Journal of Brain Research, I've, I forgot the exact name, but we, when we point to our exemplars of, of ridiculous levels of inflation, we, we, this, is the, this is the chart we tend to talk about to our external clientele. But an interesting fact in this graph as well is this black line, which is the change in the actual cost per serial taken by libraries over time. And that's basically flat, you know, modest increase, and depending on how you read the inflation numbers, it could actually mean a lowering in, in the unit cost of serials taken. Um, I'm gonna get back to that in a minute, because I think there's, there's a, a good story in that, but, but I'm gonna continue for a little bit while longer in the, in the price is rising, we're all gonna die paradigm. Um, and so, so we've had the rising number of, of Scholastic inquiry, rising number of journals, and therefore journal articles, the contraction of the business end of the scholarly communication market. And the whole thing is in a really, really wacky business model, at least from my perspective. Um, so generally, scholastic institutions, generally universities, subsidize the free content provided by academics, subsidized through tuition or taxes if they're public, um, and, and then Sometimes, in many cases, and not just in the open access environment, there might be more monies that the institutions provide in uh, page costs to get things actually published. And then so we provide this as for essentially free to the journal publishers, and then the library uses more of the institutional money, whether it's tuition or taxes, to buy back the same stuff that we paid to, paid to create. And so I know this is kind of an activist interpretation of this business model for academic publishing, but to my mind, it, it's kind of like I take the time and money for equipment to make a YouTube video, then I have to pay to get it loaded on YouTube, and then I gotta pay again to watch it. So it all just seems kind of wacky. Now it might be wacky, but it also kind of works. Um, in 1987, I wrote a master's thesis about something. It took me about two months to simply get the resources together before I even started reading or doing anything, just to sort of acquire the things that I needed to work with to read or to, to look at. So this was going through the print indices or going through ILL or actually traveling to the places that wouldn't provide me copies. Um, so that two-month process, if I were to do it today, and I'm too lazy to do it, if I were to do it today, it would probably take about 20 minutes. So two months to 20 minutes is a profound increase in efficiency and productivity over time. I was also thinking about the number of subscriptions that Appalachian State has now versus about 30 years ago. And overall, the actual number of line, you know, invoiced line items from then to now is about the same. It's probably about 2,000 individual things. But those 2,000 30 years ago were 2,000 individual journal titles. Now they're 2,000 journal titles, but mostly journal packages and database with full text access. So those 2,000 subscriptions probably results in some order of magnitude, you know, hundreds, hundred if not hundreds of times more than that number. So the amount of access that I have, have the amount of titles that I have access to, and I realize that it's rented access as opposed to owned access, is, is astonishing uh, compared to 30 years ago. So that's kind of the, um, uh, the historical contemporary overview of where we are and how we got here. And I'd like to introduce as sort of in summation of this thing is that there are three basic areas that the scholarly communication system does for us. And Joyce is going to talk about alternative models, how we can move forward, but a scholarly communication system is going to do primarily three main things. It's going to provide a timestamp of who thought of what, 
uh, and when they wrote it down. And that allows uh, both for proper crediting to the sources of new information and new knowledge, and it also uh, is a, a way of uh, implementing the reward, the reward system. Now the reward system may not be monetary, it might be in the form of prestige or promotion and tenure, but there is a reward system associated with that timestamp. Validation, uh, by getting something published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal, there's a, fo a form of validation in that um, that says, yes, that the work that you're doing is, is, it, is acceptable, it meets the standards, it's creative and it's new. And even when people prank journals with phony articles, the, 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 the end story to, that, to, those, to those headlines is that the system works. Those crank articles are discovered and exposed. So validation it happens in real time and it happens over longer periods of time as either as theories and ideas are either validated or discounted through uh, new, new evidence. And finally, the whole point of this is that it helps the ongoing scholarly dialogue. It moves us forward in our continuing quest for new knowledge. Now, I left out the, the very, the library's uh, uh, engagement through all this is, is we, we make all these things happen. And the other important thing that I probably should add to this slide is that we archive and make continued access for it all. So with that, I'll pass it back to Joyce. Well, thanks, Paul. Uh, that, that was a great overview of how we got to now. And as I move us a little farther forward, I'm not going to go starting back thousands of years. <laughs> I'll let Paul own that part of the story. Uh, so I'm going to start more or less now, and more or less in the 1990s. Um, and, um, it, and we want to emphasize it's not just about numbers and economics, too. There's a lot of other softer things that are associated with scholarly communication and bleed over into information literacy. Uh, a lot of things we're seeing the new technologies and possibilities that they presented, particularly in the 1990s, though predating that somewhat. The new kinds of communications that were possible, how we could change the very conduct of research, and then how we wanted to be doing more and in general with this kind of technology to conduct and share our research and somewhat shifting values and priorities for people as well. So that's sort of the socio uh, part of this. So I want to take us back to 2002. Um, I'm not going to go back to the 90s with this. And this is sort of the defining um, statement on open access and the definition of open access. And by open access to this literature, we mean its availability on the public internet, free availability on the public internet, permitting any users to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link to the full text of these articles, crawl them for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers other than those inseparable from gaining access to the internet itself. If you have not heard of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, I didn't put the link here, but you can easily find it on the internet. It's, it's really a seminal document where many, many people of different dis disciplines came together to really think hard about what we were trying to do in our new scholarly communication environment. There's a shorter version of that by Peter Suber that uh, he coined in 2004. So open access literature is digital online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. So you can see that's a little bit shorter one to quote, but it's not quite as full as the one from Budapest. But I think it's a good one to keep in mind as well. So I think these two are the two most commonly used definitions of open access. There was also a book by John Walensky in 2005 dedicated to the access principle, and that was kind of stating a purpose and a value because it's a commitment to the value and quality of research that carries with it a responsibility to extend the circulation of such work as far as possible, and ideally to all who are interested in it and all who might profit by it. So it's not a definition, it's more saying this is the imperative for us to do this. So I mentioned the Budapest Open um, Access Initiative, but it was predated by the Tempe Principles for Emerging Systems of Scholarly Communication, Scholarly Publishing. It had more of the economics and access to that too and, and preservation and then started to get more radical after that. I even found a few back into the 1990s that talk about some principles and then 
Shortly thereafter, we had some more principals come together um, about scholarly communication. I've been gathering all these principles and actually did a, a chapter of a book on them last year. And it's amazing that I, as I continue to find more, I put them into a Word document. And all I put in there is the principles, not the whole documents that are associated with them. And as of yesterday, I had 189 pages of principles on scholarly communication and data. Um, and they're coming from all sorts of people, from funders, from um, the federal government, which we'll get to in a minute, and all kinds of associations. They're international in nature. So it's a big movement to talk about our principles. There are a lot of commonalities around them too, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, this is just really showing that there's a lot of interest and a lot of interest in change and really establishing foundations on how we conduct our work. So here's a very brief summary of some of those principles. Um, I wish I could go into all of them because they're so rich, but obviously we talk about access in those principles. Global reach is very important, so it's not just a localized phenomenon. They want everything to have a global audience. Discovery is so important too. It's not just the access, but making sure we can get to the stuff. And what is the scope of all these things that are covered in there? It's, it's the article, it's the data, it's the visualization, the images, all kinds of things uh, that constitute both the research output and the evidence uh, that, that underpins all of this. They talk about economics a lot. The sources of funding sometimes have principles as well that tell people what they need to be doing. The context around the research or the privacy issues or anything else that might be related to sharing research. The access of um, timing, it could be, you know, embargo period. So yes, you can have access after six months or one year or some kind of moving wall. Community norms are very important. So different communities and disciplines have different ideas and takes on principles. Use of standards and metrics are growing as well so that we can really evaluate what we're doing. And readability is becoming more important, even though that was as early as 2002 with the Budapest Open Access initiative, both human readability and machine readability, so the machines can process, so we can do text mining, so we can do deeper analysis of, of material across a large corpus of material. Reproducibility has really raised its head in the last few years because we're finding that it's hard to do reproducibility on, on many research projects, particularly if you don't have access to the data. And of course, the curation and long-term stewardship to make sure all of this is around for many years and people can continue to go back to the foundations of the research that they've been conducting. Now if you move a little bit more forward, more recently the federal government has become much more interested in public access. It's not entirely related to open government data, though there are some links there as well, but the federal government funds so much of our research that they want to make sure that the results become the grist for new insights and our assets for progress in such areas as health, energy, the environment, agriculture, and national security. So the White House issued this memorandum in 2013 through the Office of Science and Technology Policy that mandated that the research funded by the top agencies uh, that grant more than $100 million must be shared openly in open access repositories. And now we've got them dictating the same as going to happen with data. And it's uh, for a number of, of reasons. And so access to taxpayer-funded research results and data is be now being considered a taxpayer right. We fund it, we should have access to it. And now we're even moving to more profound thoughts about access to information is a human right. And there are many organizations talking about that now. Among them, UNESCO, the American Library Association, and IFLA, and, and some others. So this is a very new area uh, to support sustainability and, and sustainable development and all sorts of other issues and values that are coming forward. So with all this, there are increasing expectations uh, that with things being more open, these are some things we can accomplish. Reach that global audience, as I mentioned before, and promote the visibility of our work. So what's happening is, in some cases, universities are trying to showcase or profile the work of their researchers. 
and are doing expert galleries, linking them to institutional repositories, or creating special pages, or you know their brochures and all those sorts of things. We want people to know what is coming of all this funding, what is coming from all this work, and make them bragging points for an institution, but also visibility within the institution so people know what each other are doing, which is always a problem in organizations. We would think that in our own university we'd know more about what each other is doing, but frankly, we often know more what's happening somewhere else than our own place. So we also want to advance the interest of the scholarly community and the public. Uh, part of that's the taxpayer right, but just so that people who want to have access to good, credible information uh, do have that access. Many, many people rely on PubMed Central to get information about health issues and the latest research. Take those articles to their doctors. The doctors may download them too because they have no other access because they don't have access to the medical journals. So we want all of these people to have um, this available and easily um, searchable, findable, usable. And then amplify the public investment in federally funded research. And also develop new markets, companies, tools, and business models that can compete on openly available research. Now I'm going to make a little side comment on that because just today it was announced that Elsevier bought B Press, and B Press was one of those other business models that competed uh, openly on available research. So sometimes we find these successful companies become so successful they're bought up by somebody else. But it doesn't mean other people can't get into this business too. We also want to facilitate text and data mining across domains, discover those trends and patterns and new interdisciplinary knowledge that really gives us new insights into what's going on and what the new possibilities are. New supportive legal frameworks, as, as all of this is changing, the laws are struggling to keep up and they may need to be radically changed or at least be more cognizant of what the impact is of the existing and maybe potential legal frameworks and decisions. We want to reduce or eliminate privileged and controlled access to knowledge and support social justice and human rights. So some of these policies are playing out in politics. Um, so principles become policies, policies grow into politics. We want to extend the open movement. So some of these have been public access to federally funded research. Now a big trend is open educational resources and, con and courses to educate more people, but also to reduce the cost for our students who are struggling so much with the high cost of higher education. Open government records and transparency, the call for that is growing quite a bit, not only in the United States, but in many other countries and parts of the world. We want access to more data and images that underpin the research or support the research. We want more open source software and tools to use with all this. And digital scholarship is growing too, where we take things and do unexpected new things with the, the existing work or creating new work. So you can be in more interactive with those fields or embed more information or th see things change over time. So those are just some of the uh, things that are extending. And also promotion and tenure guidelines. I didn't put those on here, but those are starting to change a little bit also to recognize new forms of scholarship. Uh, in some cases, it's software or publishing your data. And in other cases, it's even starting to be inventions and technology transfer. So there's more recognition of there's change afoot and we need to do something more about that. So we're getting toward the end here. And so I, in 2013, did a forward to a wonderful book. If you haven't seen it, look that one up too. Common Ground at the Nexus of Information Literacy and Scholarly Communication. <clears throat> so part of what we're trying to do with this uniting is so that authors and users understand the array of choices that confront them. And there's a slash there because often authors are users and users are authors. So we want to make sure they can do both of these things. We want them to have knowledge of intellectual property issues added to the repertoire of literacies. And that's happening quite a bit because people have to make many more choices, informed choices about their own work and the work of others. We want to engage with a myriad aspects of information and scholarship at different stages and roles in their life and work. So people are not just one dimensional. This is a faculty member. This is a student. This is a librarian. At different stages of our life and our careers, we are trying to get new information, new literacies, new understanding. And as we rotate between roles in our life, between 
perhaps the creator, the user, and the citizen, we need to have different kinds of information literacy delivered to us so we understand how we can fulfill these roles. And ultimately, we want to assemble the right resources and assimilate the right knowledge at the right time within those stages and roles. So that's, uh, so we're gonna start with um, the scholarly communication then, it's, it's, it's very much bound up in everything we do as librarians. It's, it's, I think of it as a system that involves people, content, technology, all acting with innovation and creativity. It involves faculty, students, Librarians have been integral to this whole process, you know, back when we first started writing things down in, in, in water and ink. Um, so we have both a stake uh, as facilitators of this whole process of this whole system and also a responsibility for the preservation and continued access to, to this whole set of, to this whole system. Um, and yeah, so we acknowledge so my summary of that summary. So I'm going to sort of wrap up in summary of his summary there we go. and sort of a lead into the next webinar we'll do on August 30th, and Kelly's going to plug that for us. But just, you know, we see in part our current status is born of crisis, but it's also been led by principles and technology changes, and it's been challenging to information literacy of the research process and its products. So next time we're going to talk more about critical thinking and engagement and evaluation. And all of this has profound implications for teaching and learning, not just in the classroom, but one-on-one -on -one sessions or informal sessions or consultation that can happen with the scholarly communication people, the digital scholarship people, information literacy, reference, technology, makerspace. We all have to be cognizant of this. And libraries continue to have an essential role to play in making sure we're as creative, innovative, and successful as possible with our scholarly communication, our learning, and our research. So now, here's access to our emails. Please feel free to email either or both of us about our presentation. Uh, we'd be happy to engage with you, and we hope that many of you will be able to uh, attend the next one.